G'day, my name is Grant Charteris. I'm farming here in Central Hawke's Bay, Forest Road Farm. Farm 327 hectares, just um, that sort of back onto the Rohini Ranges. It's um, reasonably steep property with no flats on it, with three um, leading ridges and gullies. Um, I farm predominantly deer, about 85% deer, 15% cattle, and trading a handful of sheep for, um, for weed control, ragwort. Predominantly um, velvet and trophy based. Velvet first and foremost with trophy as a bonus and, um, and sell um, the majority of, of my offspring to, um, to other people, uh, for breeders and their velveting herds. Um, where we're standing here at the moment um, is, is the only four paddocks on the farm that aren't deer fenced but by the end of the winter um, they're going to be brought in. What I did about eight years ago there was a, a fence that went right down through the middle of this gully here and it weaved across the creek and I got constant problems from um, from freshers and water and bulls fighting and so I've taken the whole fence out and fenced either side of the gully and planted it and, um, and it's got a couple of catchment dams in the middle there and further down the gully there's um, a bad erosion problem that's come up from, from, from down further on down and so over the next couple of years I want to um, put in another couple of um, catchment dams um, to stop that creeping back up the gully and, and becoming my big problem. Um, the, the theory behind the dams is in this sort of country it's, it's quite porous and, and the, it's in free draining so once you take the stock out the, the, the dams don't hold water which is not necessarily a bad thing because I've put another water system in but when you get a big fresh it, they have to fill up before they can carry on and do damage further on so, so the more of those series of catchment dams I've got in the, the more effective it works in, in erosion control and, um, and also aesthetics and with, the, with the planting of natives. When you get a lot of high intensity rainfall it's not just, not necessarily my farm that it's really affecting, it's, it's what's happening down further as well because all of these gullies are contributing to the volume of water down further so the, the more I can do on my property as well to mitigate that flow and that, that erosion and sediment loss further down as um, yeah, at least I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm doing the best that I can. My grandmother bought this property in 1956 for eight pound an acre and, um, and then my father took it over in 1976 and I took over management in 2002 and, um, and my wife and I, Sally, um, took over, I bought it off my father in 2010. So, um, so we've had financial ownership for four years now. And um, one of the things that drives me is, is when my grandmother bought this, it was four paddocks and it was back holding a guava station and none of them were stock proof. And um, now we're at about 60 paddocks and um, with the development that stage that we're at now, it's. Um, it gives you the, the, the drive to, to, to continue bettering it for the, for the next generation because I don't want to be the one that's just been stagnant and, you know, and running it on, on my, my father and my grandmother's hard work. So that's what um, gives me the drive to carry on continuing the, the environmental um, upkeep of this farm. See here we, um, we cultivate some pretty steep country. All three of these paddocks have been cultivated. We've got plantain in this first one here, uh, new grass in the second one and, um, and there's uh, kale and swedes for the stags and the third one there they just get ad lib grazed over the winter. The point I stopped here is um, down below these paddocks I've put a um, double fence and put a shoulder belt of um, um, flaxes and poplars in and um, when I first put that in I, I, I sort of I struggled with the concept of the cost of, of shoulder belt fencing but um, in the paddock where the crop is it was 20 or 30 metres up onto the hill of beard land where the, where the deer were, were, were running the fence line and it only took two years and, and before it was grass to grass so I was actually gaining that production from the extra area I'd gained from putting the shoulder belt in and plus when you crop a paddock like that there's a buffer zone above the shoulder belt but any any nutrient loss or, um, you're getting is coming through and, and, and getting getting sieved and filtered through the, through the, the long grass and the, and the flaxes and, and that shoulder belt before it hits the, the waterway down below it um, so that seems to be working really effectively for me. What I've done here is um, over the years our main deer laneway has been getting eroded away and um, so about probably eight years ago we, um, we got a digger in here and, and filled it up with about 350 to 500 um, truck tyres and um, packed them all in as a retaining wall and, um, and as you can see it's working really effectively and hopefully we've got an um, ongoing sustainable deer lane. This, this gully that you can see below us heading up to that dam up there was um, a real bottleneck for the deer and they always congregated down there and the whole stop bank and the gully of, of the, the bottleneck there was just bared ground and I couldn't stand looking at it and apart from that, from a management side of it, every time you drove up in a vehicle they were always pushed up into a corner and you risk them jumping fences or hitting fences and so what I've done is I've put a laneway just up where we're standing here now, retired that land down there and like as you can see and planted it and as you can see in six years um, all of the um, grass has grown back over the, the wall of the dam um, and also 
another major advantage of doing something like this is not just the aesthetics, it, it's, it changes the, the characteristics of how the deer behave because when it was just one fence and there was a mob of deer on either side you were getting a lot of fence running and fence pacing and erosion. So, and as you can see now, the top paddock there is one year old new grass and it's only been grazed with, with wiener deer and there isn't one bit of fence pacing up there and, it's, and you've got a beautiful paddock out of it. Another tool I use um, on the farm to, to mitigate erosion is not so much anything to do with um, fencing or anything, it's more to do with stock management. I keep a lot of my mob sizes reasonably small and, um, and don't interact um, classes of stock as much as or, or mob stock um, hinds over the winter like a lot of people do. I'll keep them in their social groups um, and set stock them so to speak and I find on this sort of country that they interact a lot better with each other and don't fence space as much and therefore you don't get um, as much erosion on your farm. Right behind me here we've got um, my father's duck shooting dam and um, this is a, also working as a really good sediment trap for the, for the, um, the waterway that runs down the back galley down here. Um, the idea behind this is it's, it's also um, predominantly pretty free draining country. It's got a deep end down the other end but um, most of the time of the year it's only water down the other half and then when you get a big fresh it's, um, the sediment gets built up and that's the last place before it leaves my property so I, I, I know that I'm doing my part to that the water's leaving the, um, my place in a, in a, and hopefully as good a better form as when it's coming in. And um, in this paddock here we've got my um, 114 yearling hinds, or 100 and, um, 111 now. I've got three dries out of, out of um, 114 yearling hinds, so 90, 98% um, scanning rate, which I was really wrapped with. And um, I sort of put that down to, um, to nutrition and, and feeding. And, and mating management at, at that um, January, February, March period. The, um, the, my best velveting two-year-old stags get introduced in mid-January after they've been velveted at um, 1 to 15 with the hinds and I make sure, I think the key is all of the, the yearling hinds are, um, are, are farmed over the summer on a, on a pasture crop and it gives, it gives the tail enders a chance to realise their genetic potential and then in January I split them up into a sale mob and a keeper mob and, um, and put with my best two year olds and, um, and they're giving, given every opportunity to be left alone and, and really realise their genetic merit in their natural environment without being disturbed a lot. And um, yeah, so it's, um, it's, uh, it's really rewarding when you can have a, a mob of deer looking as good as, as what they are with, with, with a great conception rate moving forward. Um, I currently hold a position on the on the NZDFA on the executive committee um, in, the, in my third year now and um, second term and really enjoying it but um, one of our major uh, focuses and, and supports at the moment is, is the um, Landcare Sustainable Farming um, Fund project and um, we just really want to um, get that message out there and, and show some good stories about what's happening on deer farms around best management practice and adoption of, of these tools that we can use to, to, to showcase we're right at the top of the heap of what we can do um, moving forward and farming environmentally and financially as well. Um, another th another thing that we're um, highly in support of is the, is the Next Generation program. Here we've got Daniel Spears. Daniel's been working with me part time for a couple of months, and um, it's really good to have um, another set of hands helping me out and a, and, a, and a bright mind. There's not a lot of opportunities within the deer industry to to, um, to get some sort of skin in the game with other people and learn some experience because a lot of them are, are one man units. But um, it's um, we're, yeah we're really enjoying that and being able to. Yeah, like I say, utilise the two minds and, and, and help in the next generation moving forward.